Um, there'll be a little bit of theory, but but um, not as much as as yesterday. So, just as an overview, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the structure and dynamics of tropical cyclones. I'm assuming that most of you aren't familiar with um, how a tropical cyclone works, or maybe even what the structure looks like. Uh, then go on to some climatological aspects of rainfall. So I'll look at both the global um, distribution of rainfall from tropical cyclones as well as the contribution to Australian rainfall. And then um, just very briefly look at some modelling studies, so both um, mesoscale modelling and also some climate uh, change studies looking at, uh, looking at climate models. And then finally, I want to look at uh, climate change and sort of future risk assessment. So this will be in the context of um, uh, Hurricane Harvey, which hit Houston last year. You would have seen in the news and flooded Houston. And so um, a lot of people want to know what's the probability that this kind of event could happen again in the future, or even what's the probability that, that um, this event could happen again in the current climate. So I'll explore both of those um, aspects. Um, and those slides are largely from um, Kerry Emanuel in the States, who's been working on that problem. OK, so what is a tropical cyclone, firstly? So this is sort of my best definition. So tropical cyclones, also known as tropical storms, hurricanes, and typhoons. So again, it kind of depends on which region of the world you live in. They all have different names. Um, depending on the region and intensity, a warm cord cyclonically rotating atmospheric vortices driven largely by air sea enthalpy fluxes, so heat acquired through um, latent heat flux from the, the sea surface and are mostly in hydrostatic and gradient wind balance, except near the eye wall, where um, in the inner core, where you have very strong vertical motions. So um, the uh, hydrostatic balance breaks down. And also, it turns out that in the, within the boundary layer, you can have um, very strong winds that become um, super gradient. So you get uh, a, a breakdown of, of gradient wind balance um, down in the, the boundary layer of the tropical cyclone as well. So here's just a, a, a picture of Hurricane Isabel from 2003. So this was over the Atlantic. And you can see um, on the left-hand side is a high-resolution MODIS image. Um, so it's this very mature uh, uh, tropical cyclone. I think it was Category 5 at the time. And you can see it's incredibly symmetric. So that's a sign that, that it's very intense. Um, it has a well-defined eye. I'll see if I can get the pointer. Um, very well-defined eye in the middle of the storm. And this is the same storm taken from the International Space Station. So, yeah, it's really, really spectacular, um, uh, very large-scale vortex um, in the atmosphere, well-defined eye. So we've got sinking air, slow subsidence in the eye, and um, very strong updrafts around this kind of what we call the inner core region of the, of the storm. Um, feel free to stop me if you have questions along the way. Otherwise, we can just um, take questions at the end. So here is just a cartoon, um, I think courtesy of Wikipedia, showing the basic structure of a tropical cyclone, so or a hurricane in the in the northern hemisphere. So again, this is um, a very mature storm. We have uh, the eye wall in here, so rapidly ascending air, and then this large area of uh, sort of cloud canopy, which covers most of the storm. So from satellite, mostly what you're seeing is this sort of outflow region. Um, we've got these rain bands that circle the storm. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll talk about more about the structure in a second. So that's just a, a cartoon. So here is a cutaway of a um, very mature tropical cyclone. And there are two things I, um, I want to point out. There are basically two circulations in a tropical cyclone. So the first is what we call the primary circulation. And this is the, um, you know, the sort of uh, rotating winds that go horizontally around the storm, essentially. And so what we're seeing here on the left-hand side is just a, uh, essentially a cross-section of the um, azimuthal wind speed. So we've got very strong horizontal winds in here. They're concentrated mostly down in the lower part of the storm, and then they decrease with height. And then on the right-hand side, we have a, um, a cross-section of what the vertical motion would look like. So again, most of the intense vertical motion is confined very close to the, the storm core. And then we have an inward leg where the air kind of spirals radially inward. It rapidly ascends in the, in the eye wall, and then it, and then it um, turns out and becomes part of the outflow with height. 
So to understand the, the dynamics and energetics of tropical cyclones, there are two pretty important conserved variables that we can think about. So uh, I'll start with the, the second one in terms of the dynamics. So it's the absolute angular momentum. So basically, m um, is equal to the, the radius times the uh, azimuthal velocity plus 1 half fr squared. So what happens is, in a, a tropical cyclone, the absolute angular momentum is largely conserved. So m is a constant. So what that means is that as the air spirals inward towards the storm, ra the radius uh, decreases. Um, and since m is conserved, then the azimuthal velocity increases um, um, quite rapidly, actually, as you go in. So uh, yeah, so, so m is conserved. You've got this increase in the, in the um, swirling azimuthal velocity around a storm. Then you go shooting up, and then you'll, you'll come out um, somewhere up there if you were um, on a balloon sort of following the, the trajectory of the, of the air parcel. And then the second thing that's um, conserved is the specific moist entropy, or you could think of this also as the equivalent potential temperature that Marty spoke about yesterday. So these are related roughly by this formula here. Um, so the entropy is proportional to the natural log of, um, of theta e. And so you can see here that this specific moist entropy is really just a function of T, pressure, and the humidity. And so what, what I'll show you on the next slide, um, essentially, is that, again, as air parcels spiral inwards towards the center, not only do they conserve their absolute momentum and so spiral faster and faster, but the, um, the entropy, so S, this heat that's uh, um, acquired from, from the sea surface, increases pretty rapidly, mostly because of the um, moisture term, so due to a very strong evaporation as the parcel kind of runs in towards the center. OK, so S, or, equivalent, or equivalently theta E, um, which is what I'm showing you here, basically has a very, very strong radial um, gradient. OK, so this, this picture here is a, a cross-section um, from observations, actually, from 1966, which is kind of impressive, since it was around the birth of, of satellites. But basically, um, in the North Atlantic region, at least, they've had airplanes that fly into these storms, and they've been flying into them for like the last you know, 50 or 60 years. So we've got a pretty rich data set of aircraft observations for the, for the North Atlantic, at least. Um, so yeah, so this, was, so this is uh, basically from the aircraft. Um, so again, you can see you've got this kind of gradient in the um, entropy, or the theta e. And then as you go up in the eye wall in this cross section, you can see that these um, contours basically go straight up. Okay, So the parcel, the air parcel in the storm that goes up from the boundary layer is kind of largely undiluted. Okay, It's not quite true. Like it, it doesn't, um, I think modeling studies have shown also that the, the boundary layer pot equivalent potential temperature isn't quite conserved, but it, it largely is, and it goes out to sort of large radii um, at the top. And yeah, again, you've got this idea that the angular momentum is, is increasing as you're going in. Um, I thought this study was pretty cool. Uh, this is a, uh, a study, I can never pronounce her name, but Murorich or something, 2016. Um, she was at NYU, and she actually modeled hurricanes using um, uh, isentropic um, coordinates. So here she's expressed everything in terms of sort of theta e coordinates. And what you can see basically is that in the inner core region, so kind of this region in here, you get this kind of cone of um, theta e, this kind of conical um, surface, where again you've got this air that's sort of erupting from the boundary layer and then coming out at, um, at the top. Um, same for theta e equals 350. And as you go to a slightly lower value of theta e at 340, which is kind of in this region out here, so we're starting to get sort of further out from the core of the storm, you get this really strange geometry, basically, like where you have, um, I think, two surfaces, you can't really see it, and then all these kind of filaments of theta e connecting the lower um, part to the upper part. But anyway, it's a um, really interesting paper if, if, if you guys want to know more about um, the sort of energetics of of tropical cyclones. Um, in terms of um, how to model these storms, so one, one very, very um, strong, strong idealization is that a hurricane is like a heat engine um, and follows something roughly uh, like a Carnot cycle. And so basically, again, um, as you go from A to B, so here's a cross-section of the storm, that the air spirals rapidly inwards, 
Um, mostly isothermally, so the temperature doesn't change much, but the um, entropy does because it's picking up a lot of uh, water vapor from the sea surface. So you go from low to high entropy in this leg, and then the air expands um, and goes up most adiabatically in the eye wall. And then at the top, the, radi uh, the, air is, uh, sorry, the entropy is lost mostly through radiation to, um, to space, so through long wave radiation. And then there's this leg, which doesn't really make sense in terms of a hurricane, but again, it is an idealization. And that's that there's this kind of adiabatic compression leg. But in, re in reality, the air in this leg um, um, is actually cooled radiatively, and it takes quite a long time for it to, to get from, from D back to A. Um, so that's kind of where this, this heat engine idea breaks down. Um, but nevertheless, um, there's been a lot of studies, um, especially by, by Kerry Emanuel, who sort of, uh, well, not just him, but others um, before him who came up with this, this idea showing that this I idealization works, especially in sort of modeled storms. So when you've got like an idealized axisymmetric model or something and you're trying to model a hurricane, um, you can see a lot of these features uh, in the modeled hurricane. OK, so let's move on. So this is the precipitation structure of a mature TC. So on the left-hand side here, we have a cartoon from Howes, 2010. So this is also in his Cloud Dynamics book, but it was, also, it was in a monthly weather review paper. And what we see here are um, two eye walls. So basically, we have the inner eye wall here, and then we have the outer eye wall um, just here. And this is often a sign of a, a very mature uh, tropical cyclone. And you, and you can get these eye wall replacement cycles where basically the inner eye wall dies down and the outer eye wall sort of contracts and becomes the inner, inner eye wall. And you can get these sort of successive replacement cycles that occur again and again when the, when the tropical cyclone is very intense. Um, we have the, uh, let's see, yeah, so the primary and secondary eye wall. We have these distant rain bands kind of swirling around the outside. And then this region in here, from about um, the center to about 200 kilometers or something, is what we call the inner core of the storm. OK, so on the right-hand side is a cross-section using CloudSat um, imagery of Typhoon Dolphin. And you can see, again, the inner core is sort of this region in here. You've got very strong vertical motion, um, high reflectivity values in the eye wall. And then these sort of um, out here on the, on the tail, you've got these sort of rain bands that are swelling inwards. Um, towards the center. So that's kind of the very uh, basic structure of rain, rainfall inside a tropical cyclone. So one of the really nice things about um, the, the US data is that they, like I, was, like I was saying earlier, they fly into these storms. So this is, um, these are the NOAA hurricane hunters on the left. So there's two aircrafts fitted with all sorts of observational measurements and radar. And um, so they, they don't get every storm, but they, get, they fly into a large majority of, of storms in the, during the, the Atlantic hurricane season. So this is an example of Hurricane Katrina's eye. So it's this really spectacular um, sort of sloping eye wall. So um, I've heard some people describe this as like a coliseum of, of clouds. So the, the aircraft sort of punches in there. It's pretty turbulent as it's about to get into the eye, and then it's in this very calm eye with clouds that are going up into the sort of the upper troposphere, lower stratosphere. So these are very, very deep clouds in the eye wall. And the next thing I want to show you is a movie of um, one of these planes' uh, radar imagery as it's flying around in there. So this is, um, hopefully it'll work, this is again from Hurricane Katrina, which some of you will know really devastated New Orleans in 2005 because of a um, catastroph catastrophic um, dam break. Uh, or, or several, several breaks of uh, the levees that retained the, the wall from Lake Pontchartrain. Um, so again, this is the kind of the, the time that this radar imagery was taken. So a very strong um, Category 5 storm that's about 24 hours away from hitting New Orleans. So I sh this should work. So what you're going to see is um, it's storm relative. So the, ra the plane's actually flying around, but they've subtracted off the, the motion. So you're sort of seeing everything now in the, the reference frame of the storm. So here's the radar itself, this kind of hole that you see. And so you, see, you can see the, the inner eye wall here, this swel sort of swelling um, annulus of reflectivity. And then you've got sort of the outer uh, rain bands here. You've got um, storms and other things sort of swelling around. So I'll just play that one more time. It's kind of, um, yeah, pr pretty cool to see. So again, the, the, the eye wall, very, very well defined, sinking here in the middle, um, very heavy rain surrounding it. 
And then you, you see actually there's a, a kind of a gap in the reflectivity. And sometimes I've heard this referred to as a moat, where you get sort of the, the inner eye wall, and then you've got a gap, and then you've got sort of heavier rain between the moat um, and the inner eye wall. So that's kind of the, the structure of the storm. Um, this is just another example of structure uh, taken from NASA's GPM satellite of two storms. So on the left, we have Hurricane Irma. Again, um, very deep clouds um, and precipitation in the eye wall region. But then interestingly, in this image at least, when we, when we go out to the rain band, you see this. I've sort of tried to highlight it here on the left. It's what we call a hot tower. Um, some people call these a vertical hot tower. And these are very, very intense updrafts that occur in the rain bands of um, tropical cyclones in the inner rain bands, so not necessarily um, in the eye. Um, and these have been linked to rapid intensification of storms. So one thing that we find with tropical cyclones is that, that the the very strong storms, so the Category 4s and 5s, before they get to Category 4 or 5, they'll go through this rapid intensification where they'll, they'll go from you know, um, a Category 2, which might be you know, 150 kilometer an hour winds or something, up to sort of 260 kilometer, kilometer an hour in maybe 24 hours. So anyway, this, um, it's a major forecasting problem. People don't really know exactly when this rapid intensification is going to occur. But there have been, um, as I was saying, studies showing that these hot towers that appear are linked or precede maybe this rapid intensification. So it's kind of a, um, uh, maybe a, a, sh a short term um, forecasting tool um, rather than anything else. Uh, okay, so on the right hand side is the same sort of thing from a tropical cyclone in the South Indian Ocean. Any questions up, up to now or? So there's just a detail on the figure of the yellow dots on the lightning? I believe so, yeah. I didn't check carefully. I believe the yellow dots are the, the lightning. Yes, yeah, so you've got the lightning in the eye wall and then, and then in the rain bands as well. So these hot towers are often, often associated with a lot of lightning as well because it's lofting ice and grapple and other things pretty high up into the, into the atmosphere. OK, so that was structure um, in a, a very brief overview. So the next thing I want to talk about is the rainfall climatology. And before I do that, um, so we're sort of changing gears completely. I'm looking now at a very large scale picture. Uh, I want to talk about where these storms form. OK, so in 1968, Bill Gray was one of the first people to link the regions of tropical cyclone formation to um, particular areas of the world. And he found that, oh, well, not just he found, um, Parman in 1948 um, sort of said this first, but Basically, as the quote says, hurricanes can only be formed in oceanic regions outside the equator where the sea surface has a temperature above 26 to 27 degrees. OK, so this has sort of become known as the 26 and a half degree threshold for tropical cyclone formation, um, at least in the current climate. And so I updated this um, last year or two years ago using current, uh, more current data. On the top panel here, we have the August sea surface temperature and, uh, annual average um, for the, the mean. Um, and the 26 and a half degree threshold is this blue line. And same thing for January in the southern hemisphere, where we have our storms forming. Um, and you can see it, it's, it does a reasonable job at bounding formation. But there's been studies to suggest that um, this is not a steady threshold. OK, so, excuse me, so this threshold should actually increase with warming. Um, and we, we, so yeah, it's relative basically to the tropical mean um, sea surface temperature. And I'll talk about the, what I mean by relative um, sea surface temperature in a second. Um, but yeah, you can see basically this is the, the, the climatology of formation. Um, in terms of the large scale circulation, uh, we have two figures here. So one is for the northern hemisphere, one is for the southern hemisphere. Um, you see that for the southern hemisphere, we have this large expanse of almost continuous formation from Madagascar or East Africa all the way out to the Central Pacific. Um, notice there's like there's very, well, in this picture at least, there's no storms in the South Atlantic. Um, they do form there occasionally, but they're very rare. I think there's only been three or four in the last 30 years that have formed in the South Atlantic. Um, there's a number of reasons. Um, one reason is that the... Um, this sort of convergence mechanism doesn't really dip that far south in the South Atlantic. It, it stays further north. And so there's 
not as much um, low-level convergence and vorticity to get things going. Um, the other thing you'll see in the northern hemisphere, so this is the um, intertropical convergence zone. Here we have the part of the monsoon trough in the West Pacific. You'll see that for the North Atlantic, this kind of convergence zone um, really just bounds the southern part of the formation region. Okay, and that's because for the, for the North Atlantic, one of the main mechanisms for formation of these waves that kind of come off East Africa called easterly waves, they're quite unique to that region. Um, and they thought they're another mechanism by which storms can form. And also you'll, you'll notice a lot of fairly high latitude storms that form in the North Atlantic compared to the southern hemisphere, for instance. So that's kind of the general circulation pattern and formation density. These are the tracks. Um, again, probably just taken from, um, from Wikipedia. Um, again, in the North Atlantic and the um, North Pacific, Northwest Pacific, I should, say, I should say, you see these fairly high latitude recurving tracks. Um, partly that's because the, you have these warm currents that can support tropical cyclones um, much further north than and in the southern hemisphere where you tend to get high shear and, and a fairly sharp gradient of SST. Um, again, the South Atlantic, you can see there's like one or two in here. Um, I, think, well, I can't remember the name of it. It was one in 2005, Katerina, I think, that was off the coast of Brazil and has been fairly well studied, but pretty rare. Okay, so moving now onto the um, climatological aspects of rainfall. So this was a fairly big study by Lonfat, 2004. Um, so they use trim observations from 12 or 13 years of data. And um, these are the, the observation points all around the world. And this on the right-hand side is basically a um, schematic or a, an example of, of the types of imagery they were looking at from trim. Um, so this was for yeah, Hurricane Floyd in, in 99. And so they collected all this data. And I think even though they had, they had 260 storms, I think point observations they had close to 2,000 or something like that. So they had a lot of, a lot of point observations per storm. Um, and this is kind of some of the climatological figures they came up with. So the first one is the rain rate, uh, the PDF of the rain rate in millimeters per hour. Um, and uh, they've stratified it by the intensity of the storms. So we've got tropical storms, which are the low end, low intensity storms, um, all the way up to Cat 3 fives. And so you can see, um, first of all, the, the peak is around sort of a millimetre per hour or something like that. There's a slight um, peak here as well at about five. And as we go to the slightly higher intensity, or the higher intensity storms, you get this slight shift in the, um, in the curve to the right, which is maybe what you expect with um, stronger storms, more, more rain. Um, on the bottom here, we have the same thing, but um, by region. So here we, in the black, we have the North Atlantic. Um, I won't go through it too much. We've got the East Pacific, the Northwest Pacific, South Pacific, and so on. Um, you can see very sim sort of similar shapes. Um, up here on the right, we have the, um, what is this? This is basically the rain rate as a function of radius, storm radius. And so well, I've drawn this line on here to show you that basically as you go to more intense storms, so this top curve is the category threes and fives, the rain, um, maximum rain is kind of concentrated further towards the center. Okay, so, um, so that's one result. And obviously it, uh, it increases a fair bit with intensity as well. So, so those are the two things that stand out from that figure. Um, and then the, again, they've done the same thing here, but by different regions. And you can kind of, kind of look at the different um, rain rates as a function of radius by region and see some differences. Uh, a slightly kind of broader picture. So this is a paper by Jang and Zipsa, um, uh, also I think using trim, but they they show here the total rain in the tropics. Um, I think this is, I think they did it for different seasons in the northern and southern hemisphere. But anyway, this is the total rain. You can see the non-CC rain looks a lot like the total rain. You've got the South Pacific convergence zone and all these different um, zones, the intertropical convergence zone. Um, then this panel here just shows the tropical cyclone rainfall from satellites. So you've got this massive blob um, of quite heavy rain over the Northwest Pacific. Um, and the other region that stands out is the uh, Eastern Pacific. And then as far as the fraction of rain compared to the total tropical rain, um, one thing that you will notice is that Northwestern, uh, the, the coast off Northwestern Australia actually has 
quite a large amount of relative rain um, from tropical cyclones compared to the um, compared to the main precip. Same thing in the in the eastern Pacific. So that's kind of um, interesting if you if you're thinking about what country what you know how much rain does a tropical cyclone contribute um, or tropical cyclones contribute to the to the mean rainfall. Um, this is another figure from their paper showing the difference between El Nino and La Nina years. So again, in the top we have um, the non-TC rain, so all the rain, and um, as you'd imagine in an El Nino, we tend to have this drying over the maritime continent. Um, when we look at the tropical cyclone rain difference, you basically get a very similar picture. If you kind of blur your eyes, you'll see you've got um, drying over the, this region, um, green here, green here, etc. So, so the TC rain difference looks a lot like the, the mean rain difference as far as El Nino and La Nina. Um, another study by uh, Dare et al. So again, looking at the contribution of um, tropical cyclone rainfall to total rainfall in Australia. Um, the left-hand panel here is just from the Bureau. So this is just the mean um, August, uh, sorry, October to April rainfall um, for the continent. Um, these are the tracks that they studied, tropical cyclone tracks. And they sort of found a similar result in that the, in terms of the relative contribution um, to the to the, the total amount, most of it is uh, concentrated off the, um, uh, the western part of Australia. Um, okay, I'll move on. So uh, this is now looking at extreme rainfall. So not just the seasonal rainfall, but the highest one, two, and three day totals each year. Um, so on the left, we have the one day, two day, and three day totals. Um, and these are expressed as percentages, again, relative to um, all the years. Okay, so basically the data is from 69 to 2012 using rain gauges. Um, I just said they have analyzed one, two, and three day rainfall totals. And what they find basically is that the, the tropical cyclones are responsible for about 30 to 50% of the annual maxima. Um, and that this um, is more pronounced again in the northwest part of the, the country. And the TC influence sort of diminishes away from the coast as far as kind of these annual maxima. Um, it, the, the picture gets even more interesting if they go and stratify the annual maxima by the amount of rain itself. So here we have um, greater than 25 millimetres, greater than 50 millimetres, and greater than 100 millimetres. So again, this is just one point per year. And um, as we get to the very extreme, sort of greater than 100 uh, millimetres, we start to see that, um, yeah, there's this very uh, large east-west divide. Um, and the red here if you can see, is greater than 60% of the annual maxima. So, so as you go to the sort of the really heavy rain days, you can say that tropical cyclones are largely responsible for these days in the west, um, the west of Australia, relative to the east. And I think this is because in the eastern part, we're getting other, there are other mechanisms that give us rainfall as well, whereas as we saw from this figure, climatologically, we're pretty dry anyway. So it doesn't, probably wouldn't take much to, to give you this sort of relative um, contribution. Are there any questions so far on this stuff? Yep. Um, is that also including when they've been downgraded from tropical cyclone status? Uh, good question. I'm not sure. I need to need to look at the paper more carefully, but it it may also include once they um, yeah sort of trail off and become extra tropical. Um, but I know a lot of these storms tend to tend to lose their status as they become as they go inland and become tropical lows or something. So it's a good question. Um, I would guess probably, but I'd, I'd need to look. Yep. Is that also the East Coast um, offset by East Coast lows? Is that a, um, I think it's the, the same thing as the extreme Yeah, I I believe so. And probably also the orographic um, precipitation in the east, yeah. I think, would be the other factor. But I'd I didn't read the paper carefully enough. I was just looking at some of their main findings. I think Villan, Villarini probably mentioned it. Um, OK, this is kind of interesting. So what about the rainfall size? So um, one, one interesting study that came out um, fairly recently by Lynn et al. is that the, rainfall, the, the size of the rainfall in a tropical cyclone, so we've got three um, data sets, one from Trim, one from Klaus, which I believe is related to ISKIP, but I'm not uh, sort of a satellite data set, which I'm not totally familiar with. And one from a HIRAM um, climate model from GFDL. They all find the same kind of result, which is that 
the rainfall amount, uh, sorry, the rainfall radius in a storm is set largely by the relative SST. So what, am I, what do I mean by the relative SST? So I've got a cartoon down here. So the relative SST is just the SST at a, at a grid point, or, a, or you could think of it as a patch if you wanted, minus the tropical average. Okay, so this is just, so the tropical mean is just a number per, per, per season or per month or whatever you're looking at. And then you just subtract that off the, the, um, the, the, the SST of the interest of, uh, sorry, the region that you're interested in, and you end up with the relative SST. And so what this is saying is that as the SST um, locally increases relative to the tropical mean, you end up with a situation where the atmosphere becomes quite unstable. Um, so um, you end up with, with more boundary layer moisture and things like that. And this, um, anyway, is um, related to the, both the size of tropical cyclones but also the, the, the size of the rainfall in tropical cyclones. So, okay, so moving right along, so the, uh, I'll sort of go very briefly over this. The other interesting um, thing that people study is rain, rainfall asymmetries, and they f uh, what people have found is that rainfall is generally highly asymmetrical in tropical cyclones, um, particularly the weaker storms. So here we have the weaker tropical storms here. Um, this is the storm motion, um, and in this data set, they're finding that most of the rainfall occurs um, sort of in the front uh, quadrants of the storm. Um, as you go to very strong uh, storms, the, the, the asymmetry tends to weaken a bit. Um, so you end up with a slightly more symmetric rainfall pattern. Um, the leading causes I won't really go into, but people have found deep layer vertical wind shear, um, boundary layer frictional convergence, and the land sea contrast all have some role to play in setting these asymmetries in, in rainfall. And this is just an example of of tropical cyclone um, Larry, um, and you can see here a lot of the rain in this case is sort of offset to the right of the storm track. Okay, so how much time have I got? I've got a bit of time. So in the last sort of 15, 20 minutes, um, I want to talk about, uh, what am I, where am I up to? Okay, some climate modeling studies. So briefly look at the orographic effect of, of rainfall um, in tropical cyclones, the climate modeling studies, and then this risk analysis, and then we'll sort of leave it at that. So we're sort of switching gears again now. Um, I'm showing two simulations, one from a typhoon that hit Taiwan. Um, so for those of you who know the topography of Taiwan, it's very steep. So we have the central mountain range, which um, runs sort of north-south along the island. And it, ends up, it, it turns out to be quite a nice um, island to study as far as orographic effects on precipitation, because you get a lot of tropical cyclones that, that hit this region. And they sort of they end up encountering uh, sorry encountering a barrier basically of, of of mountains and so you get these large effects and so in this study um, they ran wharf um, using a nested configuration so with an inner domain of three kilometers uh, horizontal grid spacing grid spacing and basically what they did is they removed the in their sensitivity experiment they removed the um, topography of the island and they capped it at 100 meters. And they found that um, for a very similar storm track and storm intensity, which I haven't shown, um, the, the rainfall is dramatically reduced. So it's about a thousand millimeter difference without the topography. And then I did a similar study um, in 2008, looking at tropical cyclone Larry. So this is using MM5, which is the predecessor of WARF. Um, and this is the uh, accumulate. Uh, sorry, this is the, the radar uh, reflectivity from the model around landfall. And on the left-hand side, what we have is, oh, so both of these have, have terrain. I also did one with no terrain, but I'm not showing you that. You can see as the, as the cyclone approached land, most of the rainfall was off to the, um, the right uh, relative to the, the motion. So the, the storm's kind of coming in like this. And then as it hits land, you get this sudden um, bullseye in this front left quadrant. Okay, so there's a shift in the maxima um, compared to what it was naturally when it didn't have any uh, any land due to the terrain. And this is important mostly for, for flood forecasting and warnings and short-term forecasting and things like that. So just sort of draw on the sense of the circulation here. Um, okay, so that's all I really have time to talk about in terms of the orographic enhancement of rainfall. Um, switching gears again, so now we're moving into climate model studies of projected changes in TC rainfall. And what, what I'm showing here um, a different statistics. This is, from the latest, this is from the latest IPCC report, so it's just a consensus plot for the different regions of the world. 
as far as tropical cyclone projections, as well as um, the global changes, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And so if we just focus on the global change down here, so number one, as you can see from the, the caption, is all TC frequencies. So globally, we're expecting a decrease in the frequency, although interestingly, we haven't seen any change in frequency yet, and we've had better than a degree of warming um, already in the last however many years. And so the debate's still out to whether um, we're going to see this change, but it, despite that, the, the models are all projecting a, a decrease in the total frequency, an increase in the highest intensity storms, so the category fours and fives. And then out here on the right, we have the precipitation rate. Okay, so you can see the error bar by the shading is pretty small for precipitation rate. And if you kind of look at um, number four for each of the regions and, and parts of the globe, it's very consistent. So this is, in terms of climate change in tropical cyclones, um, the, the, the rainfall projected um, trend in rainfall rate is probably the most consistent um, thing, thing we're seeing compared to many of the other uh, projections, which is interesting. And so, yeah, the, the consensus is about a 5 to 20% um, increase in precipitation under warming. Um, so, th so this is some work that some guys at GFDL did using a high RAM model. So this is their global 50 kilometer model. And what they've done is they've downscaled, so, so basically they run the model, they find where a tropical cyclone forms, and then they downscale it to six kilometers. And so you end up with this very high resolution nested um, downscale model for each storm. And this allows them to get a pretty accurate um, picture of what's happening uh, with, the st with the storm in terms of intensity and, and rainfall. Um, so these are the results from the current climate. The dashed curves are the trim estimates of rainfall with radius, and the solid lines are from the model. So unfortunately, one thing you can see straight away is that the model um, overestimates the rainfall by a lot compared to trim. But I should also say that trim generally underestimates the rain compared to rain gauges. Okay, so it's not, um, so, you know, the, the truth is kind of probably somewhere in between these two curves. Um, anyway, so despite the fact that it, it overestimates the rain compared to, to trim, they did this uh, climate change study where they basically looked at the projections of rainfall in the late 21st century, and they find that, um, oh, sorry, they're also looking at the rainiest 10% of storms. So they're, they're only looking at kind of like the extreme um, storms, if you like. Um, they find that there's kind of an average of about a 14% increase of rain rate, and you can see most of this is kind of in the inner core region in here, um, according to their model. Any questions up to now? So, and this is, this, get, this, this is from the same paper, and this gets back to what Marty was talking about yesterday. Remember he was talking about um, this water vapor scaling relationship, or he referred to, referred to it as Clausius Clapeyron scaling. So it's the percent change in precipitation that you might expect um, simply by an increase in, uh, from an increase in water vapor in the lowest um, part of the atmosphere. And so the dashed line here in each of these regions, so we have the global, we've got, as you can see, the different regions around the world. The dashed line is the um, SST change, so DSST times 7%, and you end up with about 10%, roughly 10% change in each of the regions. And the solid lines are the explicitly simulated um, rainfall changes. And so you can see that, I mean, largely, at least they argue that, um, for the most part, the, the simulated changes agree with this water vapor scaling, um, especially in the North Atlantic, South Indian Ocean. But you can see there are regions where there's quite large disagreement. So in, especially in the Northwest Pacific, as you go towards the inner part of the storm, the precipitation change but way exceeds what you'd expect from this simple scaling law. So you end up with very large increases here. And in the, interestingly, in the South Pacific, um, not only does it um, is, is it less than, than what you expect from scaling, but it's also negative. So if you look, um, here's the zero line. As you go towards the inner part of the storm, we, the model actually predicts a, a decrease in the rainfall for the South Pacific. Um, they think that's related to what we call the potential intensity, which I won't go into. It's sort of, that's also one of the few regions in their model where the intensity decreases. Um, yeah, so maybe that's why, why we're getting this decrease in rain rate. Okay, so finally, um, in the last five or ten minutes, I just wanted to finish with a, a study, um, mostly um, that Kerry Emanuel's put together in the States, um, looking at the risk of, of another Hurricane Harvey. Um, so, interestingly, this is the mortality, um, the, yeah, this is sort of uh, the mortality from tropical cyclones. 
in terms of percentage, you can see, you can see most of the, um, the deaths are related to freshwater flooding. Okay, so not, you might think wind or storm surge or something like that, but yeah, about 60% of deaths are, are due to flooding. So it's, it's important that we understand what this flood risk is, not only in today's climate, but in, in future climate. This was um, the after effects of Harvey in 2017. So this is just an aerial shot of Houston. You can see um, pretty clearly that it was a major event. I think um, it's the worst they've, they've ever seen, or at least in, in terms of histor the historical record. Uh, this is the satellite imagery of Harvey. And so I'll just cover briefly three things. So what um, Kerry and his, his team did is they ran these synthetic events, the sort of synthetic storms, using both climate reanalysis. So they used three different climate reanalysis. Um, they simulated th uh, 3,700 events um, in the historical climate passing over Houston. They did the same thing, but for the whole of Texas, using just NCEP, uh, NCAR reanalysis. And then they also ran these events using um, six different climate models. Um, again, looking at the historical runs and then the future runs. Okay, so here's an example of one of their synthetic tracks. And so you can see in this case, um, uh, this was kind of a worst case scenario, but this is actually not too dissimilar to what happened in Harvey. So I should have said that with, with Hurricane Harvey, it slowed down. It actually stalled as the hurricane hit uh, Houston. And so that was bad because it obviously you know, it sat over the same region and it ended up just flooding the region. So this is an example of one of their tracks that does that. See, it comes in, it does a loop, and it drops... Um, yeah, a, a lot of rainfall in this particular storm. Okay, so let's switch gears and just look at the return periods um, uh, in the context of a, a Harvey-like storm. So this is for um, storms that pass within 300 kilometers of Houston, Texas. And you can see that Harvey here, according to their synthetic, excuse me, track analysis, is about a, um, yeah, the, the return period ends up being in the, in the thousands. Um, Sort of thing. So it's uh, yeah, pretty pretty rare event in terms of the 1980, uh, 1980 to 2016 period. Um, we can move on. Um, this is the same sort of plot, but but now looking at the risk of a Harvey storm for anywhere in Texas, so not just Houston, but anywhere, and you can see that it gets down to about a one in 80 year event um, or something like that. We can move on further, and now we can look at um, what happens with climate change in the context in the context context of this risk model? So we have the return period again on the on the y-axis. The blue line, the, uh, sorry, the, the, so the shading shows the spread amongst either the reanalysis or the model in red. Um, the, the 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 blue dots are the are the kind of the means. Um, and so you can see here we have the 1980 to 2000 um, period. Um, the the Harvey was about a one in 2000 year event. Um, for that, uh, in terms of the, the climate models they're looking at. Then interestingly, they also did a simulation centered on 2017. Okay, so this 28, 2008 to 2027, they wanted to know what's, what's kind of the, the risk of a, of a Harvey and kind of the climate centered on today's climate. And they don't understand this, but there is actually a decrease in the return period even for the, you know, like a 20 year shift or something, which, um, uh, they can explain, I, I suppose, if, if, if you ask them, uh, well, maybe they can't. But anyway, there's, that's what they find. Um, and then for the future climate, they find that the probability of a Harvey um, um, increases um, fairly, fairly significantly in the 2080 to 2100 period. So then, um, in the last sort of five or so minutes, the other thing we can do is, um, or they did, I should say, is, is decompose the probability into the annual probability of any TC rain times the conditional probability that the rain exceeds a particular amount, so greater than I. And so they've decomposed it in, in this way down here. And when they look at the, um, uh, the fractional uh, change in probability, and I, I wanted to clarify exactly what they meant by this with Kerry, but I didn't have time to. But essentially what they're arguing is that most of the change in the rainfall is occurring because of um, rain that's happening per event. Okay, it's not due to the change in the annual frequency of storms or something like that. It's it's that that there are actually there is actually more rain per storm, and then this is kind of the net 
um, the net change. And so their I here is they've just chosen 500 millimeters, so grain greater than 500 millimeters. Um, so in terms of the per event storm total rainfall, then we, we can decompose it another way where we look at the, um, the rain per event is the integral of the time that um, the storm's existing for, so from zero to tau, dt times um, rho w, which is the, the mass flux, um, times q, which is the amount of water vapor in the air. And this is um, what they find. So on the left-hand side, on the, on the y-axis, we have the change in the mean storm rainfall. Uh, interestingly, and I don't think Kerry knows why yet, but the, the change in the vertical motion um, actually leads to a decrease in, in the rainfall. Um, most of the increase is driven by this delta Q term, so most of it's due to basically just more having more water vapor in the atmosphere. But there is also a decrease, uh, sorry, an increase in this delta D. So this is the duration term. So they're arguing, at least in this model, uh, in the models they're looking at, that the um, yeah, the, the duration is getting longer and, and also there's more water vapor in the atmosphere. So both of those factors lead to more flooding. Um, so these are some, some more studies on Hurricane Harvey's rainfall that have come out recently. The top one are the results from, um, is the results from Emmanuel. Okay, so just finally, I wanted to leave you guys with this slide. So I haven't actually read, read this paper yet, or I skimmed it. It's come out recently um, in Nature, and you might have seen some things on the news about tropical cyclones slowing down or lingering, um, you know. And so as you can see here in the New York Times, uh, there's this article, hurricanes are lingering longer, and that makes them more dangerous. Okay, and this was essentially, um, I would guess, inspired by Harvey, um, which, which slowed down dramatically over Houston. But anyway, what, he, what Cosson finds is a global decrease in the translation speed. So the, yeah, just the, the sp speed of um, movement of the storms globally has decreased over the last um, however many years. I'm not sure why the, I'm not sure what happened to the, the x-axis. Um, but this would be looking at kind of the historical period. So from about 19, 1981, where we have quite reliable records, or maybe even earlier, I need to check the paper. Um, and this is the um, percent decrease in different regions. So they're saying that in the Australian region, there's been about a 15% decrease in the translation speed, 20% uh, and so on. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm sure this will inspire more studies to, to look at translation speed. As far as why the storms might be slowing down, um, the storm motion is due to two things. One is the advection, so just it's getting sort of steered along by the winds in the atmosphere. And then there's a beta drift term, which has to do with the gradient of um, Coriolis, uh, the Coriolis. Um, and so I think, I haven't read it, read it carefully, but I think they argue that, that the translation speed decrease is, is consistent with other changes in the atmospheric circulation in a warmer climate, but it's an observational result. So that's it. Uh, there's references um, here, if, which I'll put online if you guys want to check out the references for these slides, and I'll just leave you with that. So thanks a lot. Tony. Hi, um, just a comment on that one. So I think it's 1949 to 2016. Okay, thanks. Yep. So it's a long, fairly long period. That's right. Yep. Which means about the uh, two thirds of the way across. That yep. Right. So just That's, here. Yeah, you're getting towards the. 70s and 80s there where the satellite record became reliable. Yep. So do you think that might explain why, I mean, if you, if you started your time series there, you'd find not much change, there might be an increase, so. That's right, yeah, I, I think. Comment on the observational record of cyclones. Yeah, I should say something about that. So basically, um, there's been lots of changes in observing practices of tropical cyclones over the years, so as Tony was saying, um, prior to satellites, we in the late 60s, early 70s, we didn't really have any any accurate way of surveying the oceans and seeing what tropical cyclones were doing out there. But then also, there's been changes in the way we um, classify tropical cyclones. So in the mid 1980s, um, the, the Dvorak technique, which is the the classification, I didn't talk about classification, but what kind of classifies a tropical cyclone from a cat category one to a category five, that came into effect. Um, quite strongly. So yeah, there's been a number of observational changes over the years. And I'm, I mean, there's been a lot of studies as well criticizing um, these trend studies um, due to the fact that the data is far from perfect, um, let's say, uh, especially in tropical cyclone data. Um, but nevertheless, it, yeah, I mean, 
yeah, it got through um, to nature, and <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I'm sure there'll be a lot of studies, p people either criticizing this or following it up, or, um, but yeah, it's, Tony has a good point about the data. So, yeah, Neil? Yeah, do you have a comment about the beta part that you were talking about? Because I guess I kind of think about tropical cyclones moving a lot about this steering flow, you know, so it's sort of, then to first order, you kind of naively think that that means the circulation's changing and that the steering is, you know, and I don't know whether that's the case. So I'm, well, I think it has that to. Other term, but the, well, I think, I was talking to Marty about this yesterday. I think the, we were sort of saying that the beta drift shouldn't change much at all. You'd think, in, well, because that's more to do with the geometry of the Earth. But what's that? The geometry of the cyclone. Of the cyclone as well. So maybe it does have, maybe there's a small contribution. But I would have thought the larger, con yeah, it's quite small. I would have thought the larger contribution is the steer is the circulation. So it's saying that the circulation's changing, um, that should be a fairly uh, easy thing to check, I suspect. Yeah, like whether the east easterly winds have yeah. decreased or something like that. Um, the Walker so maybe it's to do with the Walker so changes in the Walker circulation or. I don't know. I think in the paper he does towards the end they do make a comment on on other climate changes that are consistent. But I think you know this is obviously mostly an observational result. So they. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. Yep. Uh, how do they do it? I, um, so in this study, yeah, so they, yeah, so what they do is they, they, they look at the global 50 kilometer model and they find a point where the um, tropical cyclone or the, the, the cyclone in the model exceeds a certain wind speed threshold. And then they take that and they essentially embed a higher resolution model. Um, I'm not, I'm, Tony, you might know more about the higher end model than I do. But anyway, essentially what they do is they take a model, uh, take the global model, and then they nest, or they, they, they uh, yeah, they, they, they feed that global data into a higher resolution model that kind of tracks the storm. And so that allows the uh, higher resolution model to um, come up with a better estimate of, of things like the storm intensity. So one thing I didn't say is that the these global models are far too coarse generally to resolve the important features of the storm. So if, we, if you think about, um, you know, back to the beginning when I was talking about the structure, a lot of these very important dynamical structures that set the intensity and things like that occur at small um, horizontal resolutions. So you really need a, quite a high resolution model to, to get some of these features. And so the global models, for instance, don't capture the high end intensity storms. So the, re so the motivation for the downscaling, for the, these downscaling models is to kind of pick up the cat fours and cat fives. Um, that's, that's the main reason. Yep. That's it. Cass. Yes, by the same, by the same author who wrote that nature paper, actually. There was another nature paper by Cosson and colleagues um, showing that there's been a, a, a poleward shift in the, not the genesis, not, not, not where they form so much, but where they, um, so not, not, not the formation points, but the points where they reach their maximum intensity. So those points have shifted polewards according to Cosson and authors um, over the last sort of 30 years or so. But again, there's some debate as to whether that would continue or whether that was a multi-decadal thing and that's going to stop. Um, so yeah. What else is it? Ah. So, so this, if you look at the, the, the emergence time for the change in the intensity of the tropical cyclone, so we're going to see this increase in the cat force of life. So, in other words, it's a sort of signal oh, to noise. Speak up a bit. Uh, signal. What's that? So, we can't even really speak up a bit. So, I'm just, I'm, first of all, I was making a comment. There's a comment here is that. Um, there have been studies, model studies, which have asked the question, when should you see this increase in the intensity of the, the strong storms? So it's sort of a signal to noise problem. When, when did that signal emerge? And the answer, the answer, model answer is the middle of this century. So in other words, you don't expect to see stronger storms 
if you sit on the storms now, it's inconsistent with this sort of global change, uh, climate change theory. Right. My, my question is, and I, 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 I won't have the answer to my point, is that what about these other, other things, like the motion of the storm and uh, the slowing down of the storm? Surely that's got a, an emergence time as well. That when does it emerge from the, from the noise in the same way as the, the intensity uh, emerges from the storm? So, I think that's a, that's yeah. a need to think about it with these sorts of observation studies. There's a lot of, there's a lot of noise. That's, to do with the tropical cyclones. that's right. Um, and I don't, I mean, I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head, but one thing that is, um, I mean, one interesting point uh, is that there have been no detected trends in the, oh, it's kind of maybe getting to what you were saying, that so far at least there's been no detected trends in something like in like the rainfall, but, but if it's not going to happen until the middle of the century, then it's kind of, we're too early. But there, yeah, that's right. And so I, you, we, it is early um, days. I know Greg Holland is quite critical of the frequency argument, the fact that, the, as I said earlier, we've seen a good, good amount of a degree of warming in the sea surface temperatures, and we, we haven't seen a decrease in the, a, a global decrease in the number of storms, and yet most models um, predict a, a decrease. So. Maybe it's too early to say. Maybe a degree is not enough. Um, but yeah, there's a massive problem, as Michael was saying, with the signal to noise ratio with a lot of these arguments. And especially, you know, the first thing that after a big storm um, that happens, people with Har Harvey, for instance, people would say, well, what if, how much of this is due to climate change now kind of thing? You know, it's always the question that the press or other people will ask. But it's, yeah, it's difficult to know. Um, all right. Thanks.